Thank you. All right. Good morning. Good morning. So let's look at Exodus. Genesis. What comes after Genesis? Exodus. Okay. Now you know where it is. <laughs> and we started in Genesis, didn't we? About seems like ten years ago. Which one are we on? In the song sheet there, at the very bottom, it should say what chapter we're in. I re I refuse to tell you. Really? This says It's chapter twenty-four. Well, that's the old one. That's the old. Oh, okay. That's last week's. Somebody missed you on coming in because we got a greeter now. We hired him last week. It's right here. <laughs> so, uh, Moses has been talking with the Lord, talking with God, and getting what we talked about, uh, the uh, moral laws, and then the civil laws, and then there's ceremonial laws. So there's three, three kind of separate um, categories, if you will of laws that God would give. You know, the old movie, The Ten Commandments, um, he comes down the mountain in that movie and he only has the two tablets of stone. That's really not accurate. He should have had tucked under one of his arms blueprints and probably a whole notebook of all those civil laws that we looked at. Um, it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. There were a lot more <laughs> um, that referred to the civil uh, laws, and we, we've been looking at that, chapters 22 and 23 go into great detail about uh, what happens if somebody comes over and steals your goat, or what happens when they decide to let their goat go onto your property and they eat all your grass up. God is very detailed, and he's, he's interested in every little detail. So we, that, those are the civil laws. They didn't have prisons, they didn't have police. Um, so God took care of them. <laughs> um, and uh, so there's kind of some interesting stuff. But here we get to chapter 24. It's like a parenthetical chapter that lets you in on what was going on <laughs> down, you know, when the people, back to Moses and the people. Because we've been kind of stuck in Moses and what he, all the information he had gotten from the Lord about this is what you're to do and this is what you're not to do, this is who should be put to death and this is who should, you know, you could get out of getting put to death, all those things. Um, but chapter 24 here, God invites Moses, uh, verse 1 of Exodus 24, and he said unto Moses, the Lord said unto Moses, come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and Seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near. The Lord shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh. Neither shall they shall the people go up with him. Verse three. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words up of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of the oxen unto the Lord. Verse 6, And Moses took half of the, of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the blood of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. They decided to add that in. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Then Mo went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. 
Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. I will give thee tablets of stone, tables of stone, and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters, matters to do, let him come unto Aaron or Hur. Um, and Moses went up into the mount, and a, a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a teddy bear. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And you guys complain about being here for maybe an hour. But Moses being called up to the Lord. We're always called up to the Lord. It's always a look up. Um, that's one of the things I just enjoy about Bible study. Coming together in fellowship. Just coming to church. It's an up look. Everything I've been looking at is just depressing. It's just an out. It'll make you, if you're not yet... It'll make you angry, it'll make you confused, it'll make you... There's just all kinds of things. Without Christ, you can still have the uplook, the positive, encouraging look, if Christ is in you, right? We can have that anywhere, anytime, with Christ in us. But the invitation is given in verse 1. And that's why I really titled the message. It caught my attention reading through this, that come up unto me. Come up unto me. It reminded me of Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. The rapture of the church, if you haven't heard about it. <laughs> Jesus is going to say to John in Revelation chapter 4, what's that all about? He says, come up here. <laughs> Get out of there. Why? Because read Revelation 6 through 19. You don't want to be here on earth Amen. during that time the Great Tribulation, as it's called, that's going to come soon. So come up to the Lord. And in fact, now, even now, the invitation stands to any who aren't with the Lord, any who don't have Christ in them. He's here, the same God is here today saying, come up unto me. Come up. You know, get rid of your stuff leave the the others and maybe three others will come with you for for uh, Moses it was his older brother Aaron and his two sons Nadab and Abihu you might say Nadab and Abihu we're going to learn a lot about these two sons of Aaron um, Nadab and Abihu they they end up being <laughs> devoured themselves by fire Leviticus chapter 10 has a has kind of an interesting study, an interesting story, and what ends up happening to these guys, uh, the sons of Aaron. Aaron becomes the first high priest of Israel. So these two sons, Nadab and Abihu, that are mentioned in verse one, become kind of uh, important characters and really get put into an important role because of who their father is. Um, and he invites you and I every day to come to him. It's not just Sunday. It's not just Sunday night, which we have Bible study tonight as well. It's not just Thursday night, when we have Bible study as well on Thursday nights. It's not just Tuesday and Friday mornings. He invites you and he invites me to come not just to Bible study, 
and prayer, but the communion that we just shared with one another. He invites us to do that every day. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And it's not about a particular day. It's not. Um, people get hung up on what day is the Sabbath. And they talk about, and there's arguments and books written on how we're actually worshiping the devil because we're here worshiping on Sunday. And they <laughs> argue that Sunday is worship to the sun god. Well, you can use their same logic and say that Saturday is worship to Saturn, the god of Saturn. And it is in that, using that same logic. Even though Saturday is the Sabbath, as they say it is, it doesn't matter, Colossians 3.16, I believe it is, or 1.16. The book of Colossians, somewhere in there, tells you don't let anyone judge you and put this, this uh, hang-up on you about particular days and anything added to what God has already written and instated. And so, um, for Aaron, for Moses, for Nadab and Abihu, the invitation was given. And for the 70 elders, remember the 70 elders, and I couldn't help but think of the counterpart to this chapter. There is, you know, the Old Testament are pictures of things that are going to come to pass in the New Testament. So this really parallels beautifully um, with Matthew uh, chapter 17. What's the Matthew 17 uh, story? Jesus takes three others with him. I think it's interesting. Moses takes three others with him. For Jesus, it was Peter, James, and John. In Matthew chapter 17, he goes up on a mountain, just like Moses is going up on a mountain here, and wild things happen. <laughs> in fact, Moses shows up on that mount. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17. If you don't know that story, Jesus' face begins to shine and glow. That's also going to happen to Moses. He gets what's called the Mo Glow. And it's, it's kind of interesting because he puts a veil over his face. Moses' face begins to glow as he's up on this mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. It begins to shine and glow. And the Bible tells us he puts a veil over his face, not really so that they wouldn't see or anything like that, but he, was, he, he knew that the glow was diminishing. He knew it was going away. So he didn't want the people to get uh, discouraged or whatever. And he, he puts this veil over his face. And then he goes back up and kind of recharges. And the glow comes back. Um... There's a beautiful, like I said, parallel to this chapter in the New Testament. There's a lot more going on than just the historical record of Moses going up on the mountain and all of the, the everything we just read just taking place. There's a whole lot more going on when you understand in the volume of the book it is written of me. That is Jesus Christ. So, um, I love the invitation, the 70 elders. Also, that 70 is interesting. When you get to Luke chapter 10, you see Jesus sending out 70 disciples. Um, that's in Luke chapter 10, but uh, I digress. <laughs> Worship ye afar off. You say, great, we got through verse 1. How long are we going to be here? Heesh. Be happy we're in chapter 24 and not chapter 25 or another chapter. This is a short chapter. But um, sometimes you come to church, sometimes you come into, you know, where people are singing, people are gathered together and worshiping, and you yourself feel distant from it all, afar off. That's okay. I'm here to tell you. I feel that way. <laughs> Where you're not really involved. See, worship is not about how I feel. Worship is about Him. Who He is. What He's done. 
And it doesn't matter whether I'm into it emotionally, physically, whatever it might be. I can worship Him even afar off. When I'm far away. <laughs> when I feel distant. It's not about what I feel like. If I went by my feelings, I'd probably never show up. <laughs> Amen? Am I the only one? <laughs> what does Paul tell us? Crucify the flesh. Put that to death. That's extreme. <laughs> you want to end up in hell and destruction? Eternal separation? Follow your feelings and do what your feelings tell you to do. It's, it's a mess. We are, newsflash, we are self-destructive people. <laughs> That's just what we're like. And we need to come and worship the Lord even if we are afar off. <laughs> now Moses gets, verse 2, alone. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the rest of the people, they shall not come nigh. Um, we say, oh, that's unfair. What's going on there? Again, Moses is a great type, an illustration of Jesus Christ in a lot of different ways. But here, especially, he alone goes before the Father and intercedes on behalf of the people. That's what really a prophet, that's what a priest, a, a pastor, a teacher is to do. He's to talk to God about the people and he's to talk to the people about God. And nothing more. <laughs> you know, you don't talk to God more about the people and you don't talk to the people more about God. There should be a great balance there. As much as I'm telling you today about God, I need to be talking to Him about you, each and every one of you that are here. A good pastor will do that. That's what it defines. And that's what Moses was like. A man of prayer. A man who went before the Lord. The people were terrified. So we ain't going up there. There's thunder. There's lightning. There's and now there's fire. <laughs> you go. You go for us, Moses. And Moses went before the Lord. And Moses told all the people in verse three. Verse three again. I don't know about you. It's not enough for me to read through something once. You gotta go back through it. Verse three. Moses came and told all the, the people all the words of the Lord. There it is. Telling the people all the words of the Lord. Not enough pastors are doing this today. You ever been to a church and they open up the Bible, they read John 3.16, which you already know, and the rest of the message, the rest of the time is spent story time with Pastor Joe. It's just... On and on the illustrations goes, or the stories. And it might relate a little bit to whatever snippet of Scripture was read. But that's one reason here we go through a chapter. And sometimes three chapters, sometimes two chapters. And we don't skip around. We don't just jump around from verse to verse to back up what I already believe in my head. Right? Right? That's what we want to stay away from. Preconceived ideas that I've been raised with since childhood. This is what Joseph Smith says, and so this must be true. No. Hold it up next to the Word of God. And don't believe anything that comes out of the mouth of the Pope. I'm not just going to pick on one group. There's plenty of them, aren't there? There's Christian churches that do not teach through the Word of God. And they, you know, they profess to know Jesus. They profess all of this, you know, relationship with Jesus. And the Word of God. All the words of the Lord. That is what it defines. That is the definition of a faithful messenger. You know, if you gave me a letter and wanted me to deliver it to your wife, and I open the letter and decide to erase and then rewrite some things and then put different things. I would be an unfaithful messenger. Moses didn't do that. The disciples didn't do that. When Jesus gave them things, it was just to distribute. You take this and you distribute it. You do not change it. You do not twist it. 
You don't add candles and bowls and incense and, and all of these other things on top of the simple message of God. And it's, it's so... Well, when we were going through the Ten Commandments, we see how foundational it is. We get so uh, into learning and we get so into knowledge. In fact, the New Testament tells us that knowledge puffs up and we begin to break away from the very simple truth that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. We are weak. But he is strong. The simplicity that God loves you and you don't need to jump through all of these hula hoops. You don't need to do this and do that and wear your hair just right. Only wear dresses. Only keep your beards trimmed this far. No, all of that is man's traditions. Rules and regulations. If it's not in this book, disregard it and count it as dung. <laughs> it is not worth our time. And that's why we have plenty to go through, don't we? When we start at Genesis and we're only in Exodus 24, <laughs> we have plenty more to go through. We don't need extra rules and regulations and chants of the church, of, you know, whatever it might be. It might be historical and all that, but all the words of the Lord, He says, and all the judgments, all the people answered then with that one voice. And you have to kind of appreciate the people's desire. We will do all that the Lord said to do. <laughs> we kind of read that and chuckle, because we know what happens in the story. <laughs> If you don't, stick around. It gets a little comical. But we do the same thing. All that he says to do, I will do it. And we're hunched over a toilet bowl, puking our guts out. Lord, I just brought, I'll never touch a drink again. I'll never do this again if you just get me. <laughs> oh. And we make these vows and promises to the Lord we can't keep. We do the same thing. We're guilty of the same thing. Maybe it's not a toilet bowl. It could be a hospital bed. We, we make these promises to the Lord that we ought not to make. <laughs> and Moses then gets up early the next day in verse 4. He rises up early. I don't think he could sleep that well, knowing that the people said that. And he wrote down the things. I, it's so important for me. I know. I'm just sharing with you from my heart. I need to write stuff down. I can't just go to class, go to work, go to a meeting, and listen. And it, it drives me crazy, but this is what people do at church. My, many of you are doing it now. I don't, I don't care. I'm going to hurt your feelings. You ought to have a notebook and pen and pencil in hand. Ask for a pencil. Ask for a pen if you don't. We used to have some in the back of the pews. I think they all get stolen. But it's important that we have a pen, a, a notebook, whatever it may be. This is the most important thing you'll do all week. For some of you. I don't know how often you go to church. These couple of minutes, these few minutes we have together are precious in the sight of the Lord. This is eternal. This is where the rubber meets the road. Everything else you're doing during the week, whether it's your job, your family, it's secondary. This should be number one priority. We need to take it seriously. And we need to know that He is a consuming fire, as we just read, as we just saw. He's not a teddy bear. It's not something that, that we find, you know, we, we hold close and this is my baby. I perceive God to be this way. A big beard and, and he's got arm. No. We, we, we talked about that. This, it's in the very beginning of the commandments there. Do not make any graven images. That includes your brain, your imagination. In fact, the image, that root word is imagination. 
Do not imagine what God might look like according to how I might perceive Him to be. No, He is a consuming fire as well as a lamb who has just been slaughtered. We can't quite put it into image. In fact, one thing you have to appreciate about the rabbis, about Jewish traditions and, and the, the Jews, they will not pronounce God. The name is unpronounceable. Why? Because you can't. You're a human. In the same way, you can't imagine what God might, might look like what he might be like. All we have to go off of is his written word. Again, we just scratch the surface, don't we? You could spend 50 years and you're just scratching the surface of studying the word of God and you're just barely scratching the surface. Well, he wrote down all the words because I think it helps to write down things. It helps to rise up early and build those altars. Note also the, um, the importance and, and finding importance and remembering their heritage. Again, something the Jews do much better than Americans. <laughs> In fact, a lot of different cultures, countries, nations. They do this much better than we do as Americans. Anyone under the age of, you know, 18, I'll be nice, under the age of 25, name one of the founding fathers. A lot of them can't do it. It's, it's sad, but when we come across these things, as the 12 tribes, as the 12 tribes, we're going to get to the table that's going to be in the uh, tabernacle. And that's, you have 12 loaves that represent the 12 tribes. This is the foundation. How many founding fathers were there? Even over 25. There were seven. And it's interesting in America how far we've come, how much we've lost, because we just don't care. In fact, we're saying those are lies. And it's, it's working. The next generation really doesn't, they don't know where we came from. They don't know who they are. They don't know what gender they are. The identification is lost. Which is a good thing, we need to lose our identification and find it in Christ. Not in being a water treatment technician. That's not me. Okay. Not in being an electrician, a construction worker, a bus driver. <laughs> not in whatever occupation. That's what most people find their identification in. In their occupation. Do not fall into that. Find it in Christ. Well, they knew their heritage, and this is just that's a small but important point. And then he sent young men to offer burnt offerings. We're going to get into these burnt and peace and uh, meal offerings. It all comes up in the book of Leviticus. Exciting stuff. Leviticus chapter 1, you can learn all about what the burnt offering is about. What it speaks of is total surrender and total uh, dedication to God alone. I'm giving you all of me. Not just some. <laughs> I'm giving you everything. That's what the burnt offering. And then the, sac the uh, peace offering at the end of verse 5, it speaks of a fellowship between God and man. This, uh, not just fellowship, but even friendship, where you got some of the Sacrifice being the meat that was being cooked there on the altar. The one who brought it would kind of, there would this be this friendship and fellowship that would take place in that peace offering. So the burnt offering, the peace offering, we'll get into more of that in Leviticus. Um, and, then, and then the blood. This is probably the most important part. <laughs> the blood. Because every 
covenant. Every promise the Lord ever makes, it's codified or solidified or um, sealed, if you will, by blood. This is how it's made real. And see, in our generation, in the way that, that in our culture, we have blood everywhere. They're in the movies, in the video games, you've got blood splattering everywhere. It's getting more and more gory and just bloody. I, I need more blood. I need more blood. And we've lost what we lose, what we lose in that is the sacred ness the precious blood see when you're a little baby when you're like you know not a baby but a toddler you know you're i've got a, a seven year old i've got a three year old and soon he's one when something bleeds and they see blood there's this <gasps> you know oh my and and for adults i mean we get desensitized especially teenagers they're desensitized. Same thing happens actually to para paramedics. They, they, the stuff that would make normal people queasy, they just start to see as everyday stuff. <laughs> and we ought to be like they, they were, and that's the life is in the blood. It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that brings me life. It's your blood that took my place. It's not just blood. It's splattered everywhere. And so this, as He sprinkled the altar, as He sprinkled the people, you see the blood was shed for them and the blood has been shed for you. For me, the blood has been shed long, long ago on that cross. That's what the altar is. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Again, it's all pictures here that we're reading about of things to come. And it's exciting because we see the picture seen. The blood was shed for them, but then the blood was sprinkled on them. The same way the blood has been shed for you. You're, you might even be a Christian. <laughs> and the blood has been shed for you. It's done. The work is done. But we come to the table. We pick up the cup. We drink it. That's the idea of it being sprinkled on us. To apply the blood. To apply it daily. Saying, I can't go this day. I can't go one day without your blood, Lord. I need it. I need it. Knowing our desperate need for the body and the blood of Jesus. That's the importance of communion. And you will see God. That's the uh, problem in this chapter. Most rabbis and religious folks. Wait a minute. I know my Bible. It says there in verse uh, 10 that Moses, Aaron, and Nadab, and Abihu, the 70 elders, they went up and they saw God. Wait a minute, they, would, they might say. And they do. John chapter... 1 in verse 18 says no man has ever seen God and lived. 1 John chapter uh, 4 I, I wrote these down didn't I? I? I told you I need to write stuff down. <laughs> I, ho I hope you're writing stuff down now. <laughs> 1 John 4 12 yeah there it is. In 1 John 4.12, it says, No man has ever seen God. And in fact, I like the way that Paul puts this in uh, 1 Timothy. You might jot down. 1 Timothy 6.16. 6, no man can approach unto Him, which, uh, uh, whom no man has ever seen, nor can see. <laughs> it's impossible. To see God. So what do you mean? The people saw the God of Israel. The living God. I have to believe that it was a vision and that if there was someone there, and it seems like, um, according to verse uh, 11, the next verse on, it seems like they saw God and did eat and drink. 
And that just reminds me of Jesus Christ being in that upper room, eating and drinking. <laughs> and so it very well could have been a pre-theophany, uh, Christ, uh, Christophany, as it's called in some, where, where Jesus shows up. We saw that earlier with Melchizedek. If you need any, there's a big homework assignment for someone. <laughs> Way back in Genesis, we get introduced to this guy Melchizedek, and you you got to read about him in Hebrews five, six, and seven. But that's another sermon for another day. They saw God and did eat and drink. Well, another one in Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah chapter six, we're told, um, "I saw the Lord sitting on on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple." And the angels looked at one another and they cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. So, not only the 70 elders, Moses, Aaron, and Nadab, and Abihu, but now Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, saw the Lord. And the Lord, what's interesting about Isaiah is he goes on, and the Lord says, many of you have heard this verse in Isaiah 6, 8, he hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, I will go. <laughs> and he said, Here am I, I, will, I send me. And he said, Go. This is Isaiah 6, 9. God says to Isaiah, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but they will not understand. <laughs> See, but they will, not under, they will not perceive it, or they'll not be able to see. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their eyes heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and be converted, and be healed. That's God speaking. <laughs> Pretty wild. You go and tell them, but they're not going to be able to hear. You might even be able to show them a picture. They're not going to see it. You might even be able to read Exodus to them and explain how this is talking about Jesus. They're not going to be able to see it or hear it. That's what's being told. And in John chapter 12, we have a, a commentary on what we just read in Isaiah 6. For those biblical students here today, where the Bible is the most important thing to you, this one's to keep with you for life. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse, beginning at verse 37. Jesus now talking about the very scripture we just read in Isaiah 6. This is John 12, 37. says, Though he had done so many miracles before him, that's Jesus, did so many miracles before them, yet they could not believe him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfill, fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? They could not believe because that Isaiah had said he has blinded their eyes and had hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes and could not understand with their hearts and be converted and I should not heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who's Him? Who's His glory? Jesus Christ. He's speaking of Himself in John chapter 12. It's irrefutable. When you take that and understand it next to Isaiah chapter 6 and compare John chapter 12, it, you come away and you say, He saw the Lord <laughs> high and lifted up. So, Jesus is who he saw and spoke of. Jesus is God Almighty. Jesus is the Lord. And it's only by the Holy Spirit that any one of us can say and believe and really understand. Jesus is Lord. There is no other. So, Come to Him. Come to me in the mount. In fact, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary, 
heavy laden. I'll give you more laws and rules and no. <laughs> Jesus said, "Come to me if you're heavy and burdened and weighed down, and I'll give you rest." Why? Because I am the living God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. What did he mean by that? I and the Father are one. I mean, I could say that about my dad. I and my Father are one. But you could look at us and say, no, you're two separate people. <laughs> and that's not what Jesus was talking about. That's carnal. That's looking at it carnal. But the Holy Spirit spiritualize if you've been given eyes. See, if you don't want to see, if you just want to party hardy and go to clubs and just continue in your life, you won't be able to see. That's what that Isaiah, it, it's incredible, that prophecy we just read. Eyes, if they have eyes yet, they're not going to be able to see. They have ears, they're not going to be able to hear. Because God will not force Himself upon any one of us. That wouldn't be love. That would be called rape. God does not force Himself on anyone. And so, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I don't want to hear about any of that stuff. God says you're not going to be able to see or hear or understand. But His Spirit quickens us. That old King James word. It makes us alive. It quickens us stirs up something in us. And it says, yeah, He's the one. There is no other. Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the book of Revelation tells us. He is the fire. The consuming and devouring fire. You don't believe that? Well, <laughs> look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, or jot it down. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, we learn that in Jesus, in Him, when He comes, His eyes are as, what? Flames of fire. Sounds like the God of, that we're looking at right now. The consuming fire that comes. The Holy Spirit is God. You say, here He goes again. Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God. Now, I don't pretend to understand how they are one, yet three. But the, the Bible very clearly teaches it. I simply apprehend it. I don't comprehend it. Okay? I'm not going to beat around the bush there. I simply say yes. The Holy Spirit in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I remembered that one. Matthew 3, 11. The Holy Spirit, John came and baptized with water, right? One will come and baptize with the Holy Spirit and with what? Fire. Come on, you can speak up. You get extra, you get extra points. <laughs> Who's keeping track? <laughs> Oh, mom's keeping track up here. I guess she's got a scoreboard and everything. Um, and I love this one. I, I just learned this one. Talking about the devouring fire. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And everyone said? Amen. Like three of you believe it. Okay, cool. <laughs> we'll all three be caught up. We'll explain it to them later. Um, Second Thessalonians. Amen. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians, this one you could jot down too. 2 Thessalonians 1, chapter 1, verse 8 says, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is that? Coming in flames of fire? Jesus Christ. At His second coming. He's not going to be fluffy with marshmallows in His hands coming on a cloud with a big long gray beard. No. That's the that's the way that 
sadly, that's the way that Family Guy and The Simpsons portray God. Don't act like you don't know what sh those shows are. <laughs> sadly, that's how they portray them. You can see how we've become so desensitized. Lord, make us sensitive to the consuming and devouring fire that He is. This is what the Word of God is telling us and making it clear. What does a fire do? Purifies. It purifies. And it tries your faith. 1 Peter. Right? 1 Peter 1. You guys say, I don't know if it's right. I can't turn that fast. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. I'm reminded to tell you to anywhere jot down Acts 17.11, right? Where it will tell you that Paul the Apostle says, do not believe a word that Michael Weatherly says. Do not believe a word that Reverend so-and-so says. But they studied the word for themselves to see if what Paul the Apostle was teaching lined up with God's word. It's important for us to know the Word, to not rely on any pastor, any reverend, to, to be the one that we... Okay, he said it, so it must be true. <laughs> I, had a one, I had one teacher um, that, that told us at the beginning of class, back in Bible college, bring a pencil. Do not use a pen. Because you'll hear me say Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, and it's actually Hebrews chapter 4, verse 23. But you've already written it down in pen. So bring a pencil. I'll tell you the same thing today. Because I'll, I'll say Hebrews chapter this and that, and it'll be wrong. And unfortunately, you already wrote it down. And some of you wrote it in your Bible. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for those wrong scripture references. <laughs> I, I don't know why I was just reminded of that. But, But be, be those that study the Word of God. He, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. The trial of your faith being much more precious than money. How many of you are going to wake up and go to work tomorrow? None of you? Okay. I'm talking to the wrong crowd. I'm talking to the wrong crowd. Never mind. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. This is well, what 1 Peter 1 7 just said is this is much more precious than that. It's your faith. This is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, it might be found unto praise and honor and glory. Here it is at the appearing of Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you living knowing He is going to appear at any moment? Because we ought to be. And there's some things we, are, we, we will do during the week that we don't want Him coming at that time. We're in deep with something. We're sinning up a storm or we're doing this or that. We just Whatever it may be, Live like He's coming at any moment. Because I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming today. And if not today, tomorrow. And live like that. Nothing wrong with that. Son of Man does not know. Only the Father in Heaven knows the hour in which He'd come. Right? So don't think that anyone knows when he's going to come. Also Hebrews 12, 29. Y'all know that one. We said it earlier. Hebrews 12, 29. It just ends out the chapters, the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12. 12, 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Cleansing. Testing. And making us worthy for eternity. See, if you get burnt here on earth, then you weren't meant for heaven. And earth, you know, you get to the book of Revelation, there's this phrase that comes up, and you don't want to be among these that are called earth dwellers. 
They're here for the earth, trying to save everything on the earth, trying to preserve this earth. How many of you know it's, it's going to burn? It's biblical. It's scriptural. It's all going to burn. Many of us, I mean, we don't live like that. We really don't. We, we live and we think this is where we will be permanently. And you can live like that and this is where you will be <laughs> permanently. An earth dweller. But you don't want to be there. I love you. So I'm not going to let you just continue as an earth dweller. Be changed. Come up to me. Jesus would say, come up to me. Get away from the earth and the things and the cares and the stuff of the earth. Have a light grip. If there's one thing about this big white tent that I love, it reminds you and I that we don't belong here on this earth. Amen? Amen. Do I hope that there's a building here one day? Yes. But I hope Jesus comes before then. <laughs> but we'll be waiting on we'll be waiting on the permits from the county to start building and to start getting something going here. But it's such a good reminder, isn't it? And we're going to get into the tabernacle. Isn't that interesting? We all we almost should change the name to Calvary Chapel Tabernacle. The Tabernacle. <laughs> That's what this is, a big tent. Perfect timing. The Lord knew, right? Exodus chapter 25 all the way through 40 is about the tabernacle. And it's exciting. You guys might think it's boring. And for some, it, it can be boring. But when the Holy Spirit gives you eyes to see and ears to hear, you start to see, wow, this stuff's precious. More precious than gold, than anything. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word this morning. And we thank You that, God, we have, we have so much to learn, so much more to grow, so much more to just be thankful for. God, I thank You that You're patient. Lord, as I think, and as we're reminded that You are coming soon, You're coming quickly, I know, Lord, that the reason You haven't come yet is you're not willing that any would perish, but that all might come to repentance, that all would come to you. And Lord, there may be one here today that doesn't know you, and I don't want them to leave without knowing you. So Lord, speak to them. Help them to change from glory to glory, just as all of us are changing from glory to glory. And I invite you, if that's you, and you're here, I invite you to come and pray with me this morning to come up to Him, as the title of the message this morning was. God has a purpose and reason for you being here. It's not just by chance that you came today. And He's speaking to your heart. And if that's you, please, come and find me. Or pray with someone and just invite Him in. We thank You so much, Lord, for all that You give us, for all that You provide. And we just desire more of You. We desire to draw closer, closer to You, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on You. That the things of this earth would just grow dim. Would In, in light of You, Lord, we would see how You are truly the devouring fire that we want to get close to because, Lord, you get rid of the filth of the world that's so often on us. It's on me. Lord, I come <laughs> confessing, knowing, Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm a dirty, filthy, disgusting man, not worthy of anything. And yet, you went and died for me in obedience. Help me to be obedient the way you were. Lord, to lay down my life. And we lift up uh, the Ukraine, the church there in Ukraine. 
all of those that are suffering, all of those that are going through this time of hardship, of pain, of loss. We lift them up, Lord. We just ask that You would just be in control. Lord, protect. Lord, preserve and strengthen Your church that's there, Lord. The suffering church. And we know it's, it's all around the world, Lord. There's churches that are really being persecuted beyond our imagination. And Lord, you know who they are, where they're at. We lift them up to you. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. Amen. You guys, be sure to stick around. Come forward for prayer. Um, there's bread over there on that table. There's some coffee. So, yeah, spend some time in prayer with one another. And uh, we'll be back here tonight going through the book of Proverbs. So, praise God. Amen. Oh, Colossians 2.16? Yeah, oh, okay, I was, I was close. But it's the same people, right? Well, it seems like it's the same people, but they just... They're just restructuring. You know, they need a new chief administrative my boss comes in and he says, oh, you know, who wrote those? I said, yeah. he goes, oh, those are excellent. I always take a lot of time. Oh, yeah. We don't want to go to the talking about it. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we're just talking about, I just don't want to work anymore. I don't want to wait until I'm 70. People who are younger than me, they are retired. There was a woman yesterday, I was after the... Uh, and she says, I've been retired for 17 years. And I'm like, i I keep thinking that this is me, and the board is so conditioned that I'm not, so I don't know how to speak to my husband or somebody else. No, I know. I'm the same way. I know. We don't have any inheritance other than that from our Lord, right? And so it's just a little bit. And so it's just a little bit. And so it's just a little bit. I don't know if you're going to be close.